prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 21. Prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 21. <clears throat> just as you're finding the place, could I just say a word of appreciation again to your pastor, the oversight of the church here for the invitation to come along and to share in the meetings today. I'd also like to thank Gordon for his words of welcome again this evening. It's great to be amongst people like-minded, and that's certainly the case as I found in the times that I've been in Kilkeel. Enjoyed very much today, the afternoon with Jean and Wesley, and I'd like to thank them too for the time I had in their home today. So it's been good to be here, and uh, I want to read this evening an, obs an obscure passage, maybe, just a couple of verses, but I trust that <clears throat> we will be able to bring a word in the gospel from that this evening. I'm reading from verse 11 of Isaiah 21, the burden of Juma. He calleth to me out of Seir, watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, the morning cometh, and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. Just two verses, read them again. The burden of Juma. He calleth to me out of Seir, watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what? of the night. The watchman said, The morning cometh, and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. We pray the Lord will bless again <clears throat> the public reading of Holy Scriptures in our meeting tonight. I imagine, if you're anything like me, you haven't, haven't heard much preaching from 11 chapters of Isaiah 13 through to Isaiah 23. I certainly haven't. The early chapters of Isaiah, the prophet he is prophesying against Judah and Jerusalem, Israel. From chapters 13 on through to 23, he prophesies against the foreign nations, that is, those lands, those people, those nations that surround the land of Israel. I think I'm right in saying that there are 10 burdens in 11 chapters as the prophet brings his prophecy against these nations. The one we have read this evening <clears throat> is the burden of Juma. Maybe I just should just say, first of all, by way of introduction, there's two verses, and I want to lift out primarily three points. The first one is this, the anguish that the prophet felt. It's called the burden, the burden of Juma. That's the anguish the prophet felt. And then you will notice that <clears throat> a question is asked, and we then read the answer that the prophet gave. The answer the prophet gave. I'd like to look at that for a moment or two. And then at the close of verse 12, we have the appeal that the prophet makes. It says, if you will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. The appeal the prophet makes. The anguish the prophet felt, it begins with these words, the burden of Juma. Maybe I should say some things to try <clears throat> and set the scene of what this exactly means. The prophet is prophesying against a land called Edom. You'll find it in your Bible, and it's spelled E-D-O-M, Edom. It's the land where those descendants of Esau settled. It's also called Mount Seir. So in our opening verse, which says the prophet, uh, the, the 
burden of Juma or the burden of Edom. Calleth to me out of Seir. It's just the same country. It would be a bit like it would be a bit like saying the burden of Kilkeel, he calleth to me out of the Moon Mountains. If I was at home, I would say the burden of Lurgan, he calleth to me out of Middle Ulster. And we would know that we just mean the same area. The prophet doesn't mention Edom because what he does is simply this. He turns the word round and therein is his prophecy as succinct and clear as that. You see, if you were to read the prophecy of Obadiah, just one chapter of 21 verses, they have all to do with a prophecy against Edom, all the details of what God has to say concerning Edom and how that God will move against Edom and how that God will overthrow the Edomites and banish them from their land. Well, the details are all in 21 verses in Obadiah or in Jeremiah chapter 49, and I think I'm right in saying about 17 verses in Jeremiah 49 concerning this prophecy against Edom. Isaiah, he just says the burden of Juma. <clears throat> it's a burden. The prophet feels the weight of his responsibility as he brings this word against these people. And the prophet is referred to as a watchman in the verses. The scene would seem to be the watchman who stands on the watchtower on the city wall, and he's looking out. He's maybe looking out for the enemy that might be approaching. He's sitting, he's, he's, it's, he's in his watchtower and he's watching on behalf of the inhabitants of the city. And the picture it would seem would be that a voice comes out from, from beyond where he's looking and it's coming back to him and it says, watch man, what of the night? What lies ahead? What's coming? What's the outlook? You know, I think when it comes to preaching the gospel, the gospel preacher has a responsibility. And it's to tell people with clarity and with honesty that they might understand what lies ahead. And it's not easy, maybe. Not easy. I remember on one occasion feeling I should speak in Luke 16 and I didn't do it. And I remember for weeks after it regretting that I didn't do it. I remember praying that I'll get another opportunity in the very same meeting. And if I get the opportunity, I'm going to preach from Luke 16, the rich man that found himself in hell. Not easy to bring a word against people. Not easy to stand before people. Bring a hard word. It's a burden. Burden of Juma. This word Juma, as I've said, the word that we find in our Bible is E-D-O-M, Edom. In the original language, it's spelled A-D-U-M, Edom. And those that are expert in the original language would say this, that Isaiah just simply took the A from the beginning of the word and put it to the end of the word, and there he had his prophecy. He said, Edom becomes Juma. That's it. And the word Juma means silence, or silent, or stillness. In Psalm 94, verse 17, it says, Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had dwelt, almost dwelt, in silence. And that word silence in Psalm 94, 17 is the word Duma, D-U-M-A. It means silence. What the prophet is saying is this, Juma, well, Edom will be silent. No other details given. As I've said, other details are given in other prophecies. But this nation that descended from Esau, that dwelt in the land of Seir, in a apparently mountainous terrain, they built their cities high up, they were well fortified, 
They thought they were impregnable. They thought they were safe. They thought they could defend themselves. They were a hostile people against the people of God. They were anti-God. They were anti-God's people. Indeed, the children of Israel were refused passage through Edom. The Edomites, they descended from Esau. We read that in Genesis chapter 36. Esau, it says, is the father of the Edomites. It says that they dwelt in the land of Seir. Genesis chapter 36 tells us that. These people, rather than assisting Judah, God's people, they stood with uh, the enemies of God's people. They encouraged Judah's foes. They They enjoyed as they stood back and watched Judah's fall. And they, indeed, they enslaved Judah's fugitives, those that left the land of Judah and fled when the Assyrians came or when the Babylonians came against the, the people of Israel. The Edomites would have took, taken them fugitives and into slavery. They were anti-God and they were anti-God's people. And God moves against them. And Isaiah prophesies and says the burden of Juma. Edom will be silent. I remember on one occasion the anguish the prophet felt. I remember on one occasion in my life where very, very particularly I feel I felt the anguish, something of the anguish the prophet feels. I remember one occasion I had a funeral to take in, in my hometown of Lurgan. And it wasn't an easy funeral to take because the man who was being buried, he didn't go to church and he had no time for God. Yet the family wanted somebody to speak at a funeral. And I remember well, if you know Lurgan Cemetery at all, when you went through the gates, the ground rises upwards on the right-hand side as you go in. Level on this side, and then it rises to rises up. I was standing in the high ground. That's where the that's where the grave was. In the brow of the hill. And I was there early because you can get held up in traffic and it wouldn't do if the if the preacher hadn't arrived and everybody else was there. And we were standing around this grave and we had to wait for others to come. So I had time just to stand and and think. And it's wonderful what goes through your mind in a few minutes. What caught my attention was this. I was standing and I was looking out from this vantage point. I was looking out at the town of Lurgan, my hometown. Town that I knew so well. Town that I've lived in all my life. Three schools I went to in Lurgan streets that I knew so well, and the people that I know so well, my hometown, there it is, front of mine. As I'm standing thinking like that, I looked one way and I could see Union Street and the hospital. And I started to think of Sunday school days in Union Street. And the hospital, and the connection was that I had been to the hospital the week before to visit the man that taught me in Sunday school in my teenage years from 14 through to 17. My four years in that one class, and what a Bible class it was. And I know he's not well, and I'm standing and I'm thinking to myself, just thought run across my mind, if it wasn't for a man like that and the Sunday school teachers I had in that Sunday school, I probably wouldn't be here today, standing around this open grave. When I went into that sort of reflective mode, I looked straight ahead of me, and I could see playing fields. And I started to think of the fields. Looked straight ahead of me and seen that field where we used to play so much football and thinking to myself, the best goal I ever scored just down there. And I looked beyond that again. I could see the stadium of Mornby Park. And I was thinking of the day we played the IFA Junior Cup final in Mornby Park. Then I thought, I looked this way, I could see the junior high school. Boys, we loved those days in the football pitch there. And I thought of the park and, and, and the public park, and I thought of the other park. 
And I came to this conclusion, I run across many things about this town. Then I thought of the country and the fields that I was in with the farmers and making hay and all the rest of it and running the lock shore as we did as boys. And fields. And then it struck me, here's a different field. I'm now in another field in Lurgan. Silent in this field. A lot quieter in this field. And all that ran through my mind in a matter of moments. And by now the people had all gathered round. Legion club men. Institute club men. Windsor club men. The orange men and the black and the Masonic. And the golf club and the cricket club. And the captain was there with his badge and his blazer. And you can picture the scene, the Legion men standing tall and straight back. But you know what I, do you know what was very noticeable? So many blank faces. Surrounded by people that by and large generally, no time for God. And it was though, it sort of felt like well, we're here now, preacher. Let's hear what you've got to say. Just felt that type of atmosphere. And I'm looking now at the men of Lurgan. And it's over there saying to me, Watch, man, what of the night? What do you got to say? What do you got to tell us? I tell you, I felt at that moment something of the burden I feel that the prophet must have felt. I'm determined to bring a message to these men that they might not like and say things they will not like. But I tell you, I'm going to say it. Men, I want to read one text, five words, Amos 4 and 12. Prepare to meet thy God. Prepare to meet thy God. Oh, you see, I couldn't help but think. Can't you hear how they talk? What a night it was. What a party it was. Oh, the band played. Oh, Lang Zang, we all sang along. Ah, but it's silent now. Silent in this field. No laughing now in this field. The prophecy was, Edom will be silent. That's it. The burden of Juma, says Isaiah. That's it. Edom will be silent. Aye, there's a day coming when it will be silent. Your voice will be silent. And all, I don't know what fields you run in, what your interests might be, and all the fields that you might have run in in your time. It all ends up in this particular field that they call the local cemetery. I walked with the bands, walked behind the bands, we whistled the tunes. Ah, oh, what a silent now. Went to the big games, shouted and cheered. What a, what a weekend it was. Ah, oh, but it's silent now when you reach this feet. Edom will be silent. That's it. The big question this evening is when we stand round your graveside and your voice is silent and life's over, where will your soul be? That's the certain question this evening. Why, however it is you lived your life, it'll come to an end one day. You've led the rest in the in the silent field. And where will you be? The old preachers used to say, where will you be five minutes after you die? The burden of Juma. He calleth to me out of seer. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? 
the anguish the prophet felt. Oh, the weight of responsibility. Notice the answer the prophet gave. It's like a window of opportunity. The answer the prophet gave. He says, the morning cometh, and also the night. The morning cometh, and also the night. Curious answer. The history, it would seem, is this. The Assyrians came against the Edomites. They were thwarted. The Edomites were able to drive them back. There seems to have been a period of respite. The morning came. What of the night? Ah, that's right. The enemy came. Bob, but morning came because they drove them back. They made a league with the Babylonians. It lasted maybe about five years. But the Babylonians came against Edom and overthrew them and destroyed them and ransacked their land. And true to the prophecy, Edom is silent. And there's no Edom today. The land is called Jordan today. But true to the prophecy and true to God's word, Edom was silenced. Night, what of the night? Morning, night. I couldn't help think, you know, that little sequence, morning. I couldn't help think that little sequence, night, morning, night. In relation to our Lord Jesus Christ. I was thinking as we were singing this morning of the night that he spent in the Garden of Gethsemane. Deep were thy sorrows, Lord, when heaven frowned, Gethsemane. Blood like thy sweat, Lord, falling to the ground so heavily. Dark was the night, but heaven was darker still. O Christ, my God, is this the Father's will? When the Savior prayed, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. The cross loomed. And he prays if there should there be any other way. I be willing to remove this cup from me. I love that nevertheless. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. It was night for the Savior. Morning came. Morning came. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Judgment taken from him. Isaiah 53. A false accusation. And a terrible verdict. The wrong verdict. And Pilate agrees to take him and crucify him. The Saviour's hung upon the cross, nailed by hands and feet, and lifted up, as he to die. And it says that in the middle of the day, between the sixth and ninth hour, the day then became night, night, morning, night. It's now night as the Saviour hangs upon the cross. The old hymn says, Well might the sun in darkness hide. And shut thy glories in. And the incarnate maker dies. For man, his creature's sin. Yes, it's night. As God makes him sin for us as he hangs upon the cross. All our sins are laid upon him. And Jesus bore them on the tree. And God who knew them laid them on him. And believing we go free. To make salvation possible, the Savior suffers and bleeds and dies upon the cross, bearing shame and scoffing ruin. He bears our sin. Made sin for us. There's the price of our redemption. 
sheds his own precious blood. That pleased the Lord to bruise him, Isaiah 53. He hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. In order to make salvation possible, night, morning, night. That sequence, you know, we'll see that sequence again. What I mean is this. We live in a day, and we call them rightly so, dark days. We live in a dark day. We see a great decline on every hand. Ah, it's dark. Ah, but it's going to get worse. Yes, it might be night and it might be dark and it's dark today, but it's not night yet. Not the night that's going to come. Remember in Genesis 6 it says that God saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every imagination of his heart was only evil continually. Not there yet. Oh, there's some wickedness today, great wickedness today. There's many an evil thought today in the heart of men, but it's not only evil continually. It's dark, but there's a morning coming. The Lord Jesus Christ returns again. We read of a day of silence. What a day of surprise and day of sudden surprise. Because when the Lord comes, he comes as a thief in the night to those that aren't ready to meet him. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. The voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in the clouds together to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Lord's coming. Next great event will be God's people taken out in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. What a morning. What a morning that will be. It'll be night then on earth. It'll be night then. You think of all the influence for good God's people are in this world and this earth today. What's it going to be when they're all gone? The Holy Spirit is referred to as a restrainer, holding back. When the influence of the Holy Spirit and God's people is gone, and there is no restraint, I tell you, it'll be night. The wickedness of man will be great. Every imagination of his heart, only evil continually, days of great tribulation. Night, morning, night. Yes, it's dark, it's night, it's late. We live in the last days, surely. In the last days, perilous times shall come. Matthew 24, wars, rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famine, pestilence, earthquake, latter days. We're surely there. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him and sup with him, and he with me. Sup with him. Interesting. Is it supper time? Late in the day. Dark night. Late supper time. Morning's coming. I ask you this evening, are you ready to meet the Lord? Are you ready when the Lord comes to the air? Will you rise to meet him? For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Day of silence. Are you ready for that day? When it's your turn, you stand around your grave. Day of silence, the voice is silent. 
Are you ready for that day? When the Lord returns, are you going to be taken by surprise? Not ready. The anguish the prophet felt, the answer the prophet gave. You know, there's another day of silence. It's appointed unto men once to die, ah, but after this the judgment. Revelation 20, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books are opened. And another book is opened, it's the book of life, and the dead are judged out of those things that are written in the books. And tonight I ask, is your name written in the book of life? Because you'll stand that day in silence. Nothing to say. Nothing to say. All the judgment will be a righteous one. You'll have nothing to say. Your name's not there. You're lost. The anguish the prophet felt, the burden of Juma. The answer the prophet gave, the morning cometh, Ah, but watch it, and also the night. That's a joyous message to those of us that are ready. The morning's coming. Lord, tis for thee, for thy coming we wait. Sky, not the grave, is our goal. Trump of the angel, the voice of the Lord. Blessed rest, blessed hope of my soul. Can you say tonight, it's well with my soul? The appeal the prophet makes, I like this. If you will, if you will, still an opportunity, still time, if you will. Morning's coming and also the night. If you will inquire, inquire ye return, come. And so it is this evening. There's still opportunity for you to get right with God. Still opportunity. to find God's salvation. If ye will inquire. Isaiah 21, he uses the word inquire. Verse 12. I think if you turn over to Isaiah 55, he uses the word seek. And there the prophet says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. And call ye upon him while he is near. Unsaved in the meeting this evening, Seek ye the Lord, while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. He says, if ye will. You're not saved tonight because you won't. If ye will. Oh, you can be saved tonight. And the only reason you're not saved is because you won't. None need perish, says the hymn writer. All may live, for Christ has died. Way of salvation is possible. Christ has died on that center tree. Next salvation possible. He bore your sin and mine in his own body on the tree. He's willing and able to forgive all who will come unto God by him. But you haven't done so yet. The prophet says, if you will, inquire, inquire. Then he says, return. Again, in, in Isaiah 55, he uses the word return. He says, he says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. For he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. There's one who is waiting in mercy tonight. And there's one who will abundantly pardon but the next move is yours. Let the wicked forsake his way. You have to forsake the old way. Let the wicked forsake his way. On the unrighteous man his thoughts, I tell you, you have to have a change of thinking, a change of heart. You need to recognize you're a sinner in the sight of God and unworthy of, of God's judgment. Ah, but seek him for mercy and forgiveness 
and acknowledge your sin and come to him just as you are. He says, if you will inquire, inquire ye, return. Interesting that the verse finishes with a word that so often is the commencement of a verse. Come. Finishes with come. If ye will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. Isaiah 55 again. O everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye by and eat. Yea, come without money and without price. You see, God's salvation is absolutely free because Jesus paid it all. And it's free to us, not cheap. Not cheap. The great price of our salvation has been paid with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. But it's without money and without price to for us. We just need to come. To the thirsty, come. To the bankrupt, come. To the hungry, come. Everyone, come. Open to all. I was thinking of Luke 16, of a man who came. It says that he, it says that he came and he called for a light. And it says that he sprang in. Can you see the urgency and the earnestness? And it says that he came trembling. Can you see the reality of this man in his search? Did you see him falling down? Did you hear him crying out, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the answer, Acts 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The anguish the prophet felt, he prophesied of a day of silence. The answer the prophet gave, he told them there's a day coming, suddenness and surprise, morning coming, and also the night. The appeal the prophet made, if ye will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. There's a day of salvation possible, if only you will come. I trust this evening that for some in our meeting, not yet saved, that you will surely seek the Lord while he may be found. Don't put the matter of your soul's salvation off a moment longer. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Our closing hymn this evening is 260.